Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to the Corona Chamber of Commerce uh, for the opportunity to come and speak to you today and to the board, to Stephanie for making this all work. Thanks to all of those who work behind the scenes for events like this to make them happen. Uh, you know, a lot of us just come in here and we sit down and stuff happens before our very eyes, uh, but there are a lot of things that occur behind the scenes that uh, make that possible. So, um, and one of the things that will make this possible, are you ready, Tim? Okay. Um, so, you know, we've heard a lot about the local economy today. Uh, Rob Fields from Riverside County EDA came in and he talked about how uh, the county has a strategic plan to promote economic growth and um, we heard from Kerry and from Heidi also with the EDA uh, talking about work workforce development. Um, you know, in my opinion, in my estimation, the, uh, the, the most we have a lot of assets and resources in the Inland Empire, Corona in particular, but the most malleable, the most valuable resource is our people. And it starts with those of you who are here listening today, uh, young individuals, so glad you could come. This is, you know, all the, I don't know how you're managing to sit through all this grown-up stuff. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, talking about the economy, I didn't know what the economy was when I was, I don't know, you guys in high school or in, yeah. Okay, so, uh, but it's all very important and, and that's part of the reason I've been asked to come here. We've got a local economy that's very dynamic. It's come back strong from a very difficult, not Great Depression, but Great Recession. And, uh, and so here we are in 2018. I think one question is how long is this gonna last? And uh, what can we do over the next couple of years to, uh, to help our region grow? Um, and, and it was exciting to hear uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, from the president from, from Norco College, you know, the concept of community college has changed so much in these last few years. Uh, even the so-called middle wage jobs that we hear are on the rise in number are jobs that require, at least in many instances, require some skills and in some cases certain technical skills or maybe some IT skills because that's the 21st century we find ourselves in. So take that uh, piece of advice to, you know, do what you can if you're, um, if you're still in school to make sure that you're aware of these kinds of things that you've got to operate with. Okay, so my job as I see it is you've heard a lot about the local economy, the county economy. My job is to take a step back and to give you that backdrop in the form of the U.S. and California economy and also what's happening here locally and talk about uh, a variety of things as they relate to the economy. How's the economy doing? Where is it headed? Uh, it, uh, what's happening to the makeup of our local economy? Is it changing? And the answer is yes. Uh, what kinds of things should we be looking for if we want it to continue to grow and be the dynamic place that we know it is? So um, we're gonna get started here uh, by, and I can't see anything, so um, I'm doing this kind of on the fly here. Uh, we're going to get started by taking a look at what's happening nationally. Uh, we are bombarded with news about what's happening in the national economy, whether it, uh, we heard just, I guess it was yesterday, about GDP growth rates. We hear about budget issues and tax cuts just passed uh, at the tail end of last year. Um, a whole slew of things are happening at the national level. Then I want to talk a little bit about the state of California and how we're doing as an economy. because. A lot of people don't realize uh, that the state economy, the state of California, has actually outperformed most of the states across the nation, uh, despite the fact that we're viewed as a high-cost state, a high-priced state, a heavily regulated state. So that's important for us to know because somehow or another, our private sector uh, has managed to succeed, if not thrive, uh, in the California economy. And um, you know, it, I think we need to expect that that's gonna continue. The next thing that we'll be talking about, um, if you could go back for one second, please. Yeah, the local economy, then a, a, a quick look at real estate, and then we'll wrap up, and if time permits, um, maybe I'll be allowed to take some questions, okay? So now let's go on to the head, herd of the news. So I, I sort of talked about this already. We hear a lot of things in the news about what's happening in the economy. 
We saw the tax cuts that were put in place at the tail end of last year. Uh, Congress passed a budget uh, recently that uh, will call for uh, trillion dollar deficits for several years running. Um, those are things that are happening at the national level. Here in the state of California, if you've been paying any attention, you'll know that we've been hearing a lot about uh, housing needs, affordable housing, uh, homelessness, and, and a whole variety of things relating to that particular topic. It's very important. In our, in our opinion, the uh, future growth of the economy depends in part on our ability to meet the housing needs of our of our residents uh, going forward. And, and that's been a challenge for the last 30 years, really, in the state of California. Uh, and so the one other thing that I, if I get a chance, I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, we heard from Washington, D.C. that uh, the Trump administration would like to see the economy speed up. We'd like to get it to maybe three or four, maybe four percent growth. And the question is, is that even feasible? So if, um, as we go through this, we'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide, please. So when I take a look at the, uh, at the U.S. economy initially, I look at it as a living, breathing organism, and I ask the question, well, what are the vital signs of the economy? How well is it performing? And in that sense, um, there are three things that we look at. The GDP growth rate, gross domestic product, it's the measure of all economic activity in the U.S. economy. We also look at labor market conditions, specifically job gains and the unemployment rate. And third, we take a look at what's happening with the rate of inflation. So we'll, we'll work through each of those in, in step, and then we'll move on to the uh, statewide economy. So GDP, the heartbeat of the economy, uh, has generally been growing at about 2% or a little bit more these last few years. Uh, we just heard last, uh, yesterday that GDP in 2017 grew at 2.3%, pretty much in line with what we expected and in line with what we've seen the last few years. Um, the big contributor to our national economy um, a lot of people don't realize this, is the private sector. 87% of our economy is driven by the private sector. 70% of that comes from the consumer or household sector. Um, and if you, I don't know if you can read this, but over on the far right-hand side for 2017, you can see that out of the 2.3% growth, 1.9% of that came from consumer spending. We got a, another boost from investment, which is business spending, another half percentage point. So those two together gave us 2.4%. And then exports, we, we sell stuff to other people and we buy stuff from other countries. We've been running a trade deficit. I'll talk more about this in a few minutes, but that, tends, that detracts from GDP growth. So uh, that took away a notch and government was essentially flat. That's how we got to 2.3% growth. But you can, the point behind going through those numbers is to illustrate how important the private sector is to the growth of our economy. And through thick and thin, believe it or not, it's that private sector that keeps the economy moving forward, especially the consumer sector. So if we look at the next slide, um, you'll see that I call the consumer sector the flywheel of the economy. It's what lends momentum to the economy, no matter what's happening everywhere else. And consumer spending has been growing nicely and fairly steadily over the last several quarters. Uh, this is real consumer spending, so it's adjusted for inflation. And we're seeing nice increases both in goods purchases and in services. Uh, we thought we hit a record for car sales a couple years ago, and we're continuing to see very strong car sales. And that's just one of the many items on the durable goods side of things that we look at. When you think about it, you know, a lot of people buy cars on credit, right? They, they get a car loan. Um, and so that means that if you're going to buy a car, you're going to take on a loan, you have to figure out whether or not you're going to be able to pay off that loan. If you're not, if you don't think you're going to be able to pay it off, then you're not going to take on that loan. I mean, if you're smart, right? Uh, <laughs> so when people are buying cars, when people are buying washing machines and they're doing so on credit, that's partly a manifestation of their sense that their economic security, their financial security is good, that looking forward, they're gonna maintain their jobs, they're gonna be uh, seeing their wages or their or other forms of income on the rise. So when we see increases or steady gains in durable goods purchases, that's what this tells us. That tells us that the consumer sector is confident about the outlook, whether it's a couple years out or even four years out. If we go to the next slide, we have to ask the question, okay, what's driving consumer spending? 
increases in income are one source of how to spend, how to pay for that increase in consumer spending. So we've seen nice gains in inflation adjusted consumer or, or personal income. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that households have been working off or actually winding down their savings rates. So out of the entire consumer sector story that I have to bring to you, the one concern we have at this time is that the savings rate has been falling and uh, it, it's getting on the low side, not enough to be concerned about. And, and you, you know, if you have a savings e account in a bank, you're going to say to yourself, well, I know why savings rates are going down. It's because we're getting, what is it, a half percent on savings, next to nothing on savings. And that's absolutely true. This spike that you see in savings rates that occurred a few years ago had a lot to do with caution on the part of the consumer sector, worried about what was happening in the financial markets after the financial meltdown, worried about what was happening in the general economy, and figuring, okay, well, at least I'll park my savings for the time being in a savings account or other kind of account with a financial institution. But what we're seeing right now is they're pulling back from that. And over on the right-hand side, you can see that wealth has been on the rise. There are two kinds of wealth here. On the bottom, you've got real estate-related wealth. And at the top, you have other kinds of financial wealth. Um, and so the, the latter really took off with the gains in the stock market in the wake of the Great Recession. Home equity has taken a while longer to come back. And in some places, um, it's not fully back to where it was uh, before the Great Recession. This would be one area where that has occurred here in the Inland Empire. But for, for most households, you know, their major source of wealth um, is really their home. Most households may be passively invested in the stock market or in the financial markets through retirement funds and things like that. So they don't really pay much attention to that when it comes to spending on consumer uh, expenditures, such as we're talking about right now. Okay. But as home values increase, that makes people feel better about their financial situation, gives them a little bit more confidence about spending. So that's contributing in part to this increase in consumer spending. Next, please. Um, and credit card use is on the rise, but it's still very much in a good, a good balance, I guess I would say, because households continue to exercise a fair amount of um, caution as it relates to their use of credit. And if you take a look at these next couple of figures, you'll see that our, the financial obligations on the part of households are nowhere near uh, the danger zone where they were just a few years ago. And the household debt to income ratio, which is at about 16, 16.5%, is right about at the long run average. So you'll hear stories that one of my jobs, as I see it here, is to take those snippets of headlines that you hear and to shed some light on them. And so if you listen to the news, you're going to hear that household debt has never been higher. OK, but incomes have also increased. And so while debt's increasing, uh, the assets behind those debts, those value, the value of those assets has been on the rise, and incomes have been on the rise. And so consequently, the ability to service that debt is actually in good shape. So. Um, a lot of times we hear little news snippets that don't give a complete story. And so you want to ask yourself the question, you know, is this everything I need to know, be able to size up what I'm hearing and determine whether this is good news or if this is bad news. So uh, the bottom line is that while households are stepping forward in increasing their use of credit, uh, it's because they have more and more confidence in their own financial wherewithal going forward. And they're nowhere near getting to the point where we were a few years ago. And quite frankly, there are a lot of constraints on our ability to get there. So we are a long ways away from that. If we move on to the next slide, please. We move on from the consumer sector, which I've been talking about, to business spending. With business spending, we look at things like buying or building structures, uh, equipment purchases, and intellectual property, software, and things like that. And in 2017, those three categories were up, as you can see here in the figure. A couple of years ago, though, we saw that uh, two of those three categories were down, investment in structures and equipment. That had to do almost entirely with what was happening in the energy sector. So with the slide in energy prices, in oil prices in particular, we saw 
a real pullback in energy exploration and, and extraction. And so those are both very capital intensive sectors, a lot of investment in uh, structure and equipment. So the pullback that you're seeing there in 2015 and 16 had to do with that, with oil prices and energy prices more general, generally stabilizing over the past couple of years, we've seen that that sector has settled out, that that's coming back. Uh, and I don't have a slide for this, but I think it's worth knowing that um, we continue to find new deposits of oil in the United States. And at the present time, we're, we're actually one of the largest producers of oil in the entire world, which is a, uh, something I never thought I'd be able to say uh, for many, many decades because we, uh, you know, we were importing oil from the Middle East and so many other places, and we continue to do that because there are different types of oil. But the fact of the matter is that we um, produce and extract uh, an, an amount of oil at the present time that puts us among the top. Uh, so we're seeing things uh, improve on the business spending side of things. Business spending accounts for about 17% of the economy. It's not quite as steady through ups and downs as consumer spending is, so it's more volatile. And over this next couple of years, we're gonna see, uh, we should be seeing increases in business spending because the tax cuts in part make it more favorable for businesses to, to increase their investment. Next slide, please. On the trade front, so, we, so as I'm going through the different parts of the economy, started off with the consumer sector, then I talked about business, now I'm going to talk about international trade. Uh, we have run a trade deficit for many, many years. That means we're importing more stuff than we're exporting. And um, part of that has had to do with the fact that our economy over the post-recession period has generally been stronger than, the, than those of our trading partners. And so as we've improved and chugged along, we bought our stuff, we've also bought their stuff. So our imports have been on the rise. In these last couple of years, our major trading partners have seen their economy stabilize and register pretty, st uh, pretty steady growth. As a result of that, the exports that you see down there in the bottom, the bar chart, have actually been accelerating faster than our imports. But we're still running a, a deficit and uh, for as long as we have an economy that is generally bigger and stronger than the rest of the world, that's pretty much what's gonna happen. Um, a lot of people talk about, well, we need to bring down that deficit. How do we do that? We, well, we can maybe buy more American stuff. You could do that, but I s submit to you, maybe we could increase the exports. We are 5% of the world's population. There's a 95% of the world's population out there we could sell more stuff to. And so I think we need to think long and hard about our ability not just to maybe rein in our imports, which I don't think we're gonna do, uh, but rather to see where there are export opportunities for us to sell more stuff. Thank you. All right, so we've got um, consumers, business, international trade, finally government, can't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, what you're looking at right there is the budget deficit for the U.S. government. And um, so with the passage of the tax cuts and the passage of the budget bill most recently, we're looking at trillion dollar deficits um, over the next few years. This stretches out. This is a congressional budget office projection, but it stretches out to the year 2027. Excuse me. And so, um, as an economist, economists, as you, as you know, have a number of different points of view on, most, on many things, but there's uh, agreement on more than you would think. Uh, and one thing that many economists think is that when we're doing well uh, as an economy, taxes are being generated, they're being paid into the government coffers. And this would be a good time for the U.S. government to uh, work down the national debt, which would mean that we would not run a budget deficit, but a budget surplus. So in good times, we ought to run a budget surplus, chip away at that national debt. In tough times, it's okay to run a uh, budget deficit because the government can be the spender of last resort, so to speak, to prop up the economy when the private sector is going through hard times. Um, 
that's not happening here. I think it's pretty clear that uh, we're looking at deficits as far as the eye can see. And um, most importantly, so I'm not so much concerned about the level of national debt as I am concerned about um, increasing debt service and how that increasing debt service means that we're going to have less money to spend on other stuff. Now, admittedly, we're in a very low interest rate environment, so borrowed money is cheap. So if you're going to borrow money, this is a good time to do it, even if you're the federal government. But just be aware of the fact that the borrowed money requires debt service. Debt service has to come out of government coffers, and uh, that means that you have less to spend on other stuff. So um, it's a quick and dirty about the federal government. I would just point out that at the state level and at the local level, thank you, um, the, um, at the state and local level, uh, we've had fairly good budget situations, but as you heard, this whole pension obligation issue is something that is haunting state and local government uh, here in the state of California, as well as across the country. And it's something that really is the same sort of situation where there's an obligation that has to be paid. And in order to do that, that means we're going to have less money to spend on other stuff for our local residents. So that's a real challenge for local government going forward. So all in all, just pulling all these different strands of the, of the US economy together, we've got steady growth at the, at the consumer sector level. We've got a much improved outlook for business spending government sector is pretty much going to be neutral in terms of its impact on the U.S. economy, although we'll see that budget deficit mushroom. And uh, trade is negative in the sense that we're importing more than we're exporting. But I like to turn those lemons into lemonade by saying it's because our economy is so strong that we're spending money on everything, including imports. So it's not all bad. So let's, that's kind of a rundown on what's happening in the, in the GDP sphere. Now let's take a look a little bit at uh, the labor market. This is um, so important to understanding what's happening in real time with the U.S. economy. The unemployment rate is uh, at its lowest level in about a dozen and a half years, which is really good news. Two unemployment rates appear there up on the top left-hand side. One is the one at the top, the, the bottom one is the headline rate, 4% unemployment. Up above is this U6, which accounts for discouraged workers, people who would like to work full-time but are working part-time, a whole array of, of other kinds of categories of workers who are unemployed in some manner. But you can notice that even that has come down. It's generally about twice the headline rate. And so with the headline rate at about 4%, you can see that the U6 uh, rate, which is more all-encompassing, is at about 8%, quite a bit lower than it was before. Quick word on how the Great Recession compares with or compared with the Great Depression. You can see going back to the worst days of the recession, the headline rate in red hit 10%. It was like 9.6%. Okay, during the Great Depression, any idea what the unemployment rate was? 25%. Okay, so. There's a reason why it's called a, a recession and not a depression. As tough as it was, we only had a relatively modest increase in the unemployment rate. During the Great Depression, GDP fell by 50%. In this most recent recession, it fell by, by 3, 4, 5%. Okay? So there's just no comparison, and I'd rather deal with what we just went through. I mean, it's, now it's well into the rearview mirror, or so we should think. And um, uh, it's something that we can we can work through going forward. On the right-hand side, job gains, as you can see, have slowed down. And now, over the next couple of years, we're probably going to match that 1.5% gain that you see for 2017. Okay? As the economy was, was improving, uh, we were seeing fast job gains. But now that we have gotten to the point where we're hitting record levels of jobs and job creation is, has continued for uh, well over five years now, the pace of job growth has slowed. So going forward, we think 1.5% is about as fast as we can get. If we look at the next slide, um, it's, it's not that the economy doesn't have jobs. In fact, we have a record number of job openings nationally at the present time. Uh, and uh, those job openings are not just in tech. Those job openings, over on the right-hand side, you've got this rate, okay? Now, the rate right now 
overall for the U.S. economy for all jobs is 4.0. Anything higher than that means that you've got more job openings in that industry than on average, and anything less, you've got fewer job openings than on average. And you look at this list over on the right-hand side, and you've got things like private um, education and health. So healthcare, I understand. We've got a lot of job openings there. Leisure and hospitality, that corresponds to restaurant jobs, hotel jobs. So jobs that really don't require a lot of skill are hard to fill, which is something that people are having a difficult time wrapping their heads around. So yes, there are job openings in the tech sector, but there are also jobs in entry-level kinds of uh, opportunities in some of these other sectors. And as you heard earlier, middle-wage jobs are also uh, on the rise. Health is actually a mishmash of high-skilled, middle-skilled, and low-skilled jobs. So uh, you've got job opportunities all across the board in that sector. So we go to the next slide. So we have job openings, and it's a record high number of job openings. Why is that? It's because the unemployment rate's very low. Our labor force is growing at less than one, uh, one sorry, less than 1% per year. That's what you see over on the left-hand side. Slowed down markedly just in the last couple of years because we used up all the surplus labor, and now we're only growing as fast as we can put people into the adult workforce, okay? It's really a function of two things. Excuse me. Uh, it's a function of our population growth, so how fast we create babies, and then they turn into it 18 year olds enter the workforce, okay? And then the other thing is migration, international migration. Our birth rates have slowed in the US to the point where if we wanna to grow to our potential, we have to make smart moves with respect to immigration. So I'll come back to that in just a second. But the bottom line is that we're, our ability to grow going forward is gonna depend not just on our domestic labor force, but also um, some version of international migration and that's been the case for, you know, for generation after generation. The other aspect of what's constraining our uh, job gains and our overall performance in the economy is the labor force participation rate over on the right-hand side. Uh, we're sort of stuck at about 63%. That slide that you see from the left to the right has almost entirely to do with the uh, boomer generation leaving the workforce. Okay, some, you know, a few years ago, people were worried it was because Certain workers were ill-equipped for today's jobs. They were structurally unemployed because they had an old set of job skills and this is a new economy, that kind of thing. That's less of an issue today than it, is, than it was back then. Right now, what we're looking at is boomers leaving the workforce and um, not nearly enough people coming in uh, in the younger ranks to backfill and replace those workers. And so, go ahead. And so that's really why the U.S. economy has an upper bound on how fast it can grow. You take the 1% growth in labor force, excuse me, and about a 1% growth in productivity each year, one and one makes two, you get an upper bound of about 2% in long-term growth for the U.S. economy. We can do better than that in any given quarter, maybe in, even in any given year, but on average, we're gonna converge on that. Uh, one way to overcome that would be to um, have a, uh, an immigration policy that's gonna work, okay? Now, inflation, you know, everybody who is, let's say, 45 and older, hates the word inflation uh, because you saw during the 1970s the energy crisis, the oil embargo, hyperinflation, stagflation, not hyperinflation, I'm sorry, got carried away, stagflation, so no inflation is good inflation. That's what many of us think. And, um, and yet the Fed's been saying, you know, we need 2% inflation. Um, so why is that? How is their story different from our understanding that no inflation is good? The answer is that to some inflation is necessary to indicate that the economy is moving forward. 2% inflation is tolerable low single digit inflation for a short period of time might be tolerable. Anything more than that is not because it can wreak havoc on the economy. So we expect in 2018 to pretty much match the inflation rate that we've seen over the last couple of years. A um, little bit more inflation. Some of it's gonna come from wage gains to workers. 
but another big determinant of inflation uh, is commodities prices, and they're really not spiking anytime soon. We don't see anything that's really going to cause an inflation spike, so two, low 2% two is pretty much in the cards going forward. Let's talk a little bit about economic policy. I don't have enough time to go into great detail, but let's first look at, um, uh, I'm not sure what we have next. Yes, okay. So I talked a little bit about the tax cuts that uh, were part of the tax plan at the tail end of last year. Most but not all households are gonna have more after-tax income, so that's gonna support consumer spending. Businesses, uh, for a variety of reasons with that tax measure, are going to be better off and they're gonna be able to invest more. So that's gonna boost uh, GDP in the near term. Both of those effects are expected to really uh, evaporate, I guess I would say, uh, by about the year 2020. So this whole tax plan is front and loaded to give the biggest bang for the buck in 2018, 2019, maybe a little bit in 2020. Okay, so all that's gonna boost the, um, the US economy. Uh, we already talked about the, the deficit it will induce. I spoke already a couple of minutes here about the need for, uh, for immigration reform. And we've done this before, we did so. We had successful immigration reform under the Reagan administration. So even a Republican administration can accomplish something like that. Um, but there are other issues that are on the table that we need to be aware of, especially here in Southern California. Uh, international trade, you know, we have the largest container uh, complex in the Western Hemisphere here in Los Angeles and Long Beach. 40% of the containers that come into the United States come through those two ports. As our economy continues to thrive, we will see more import and export activity going through those ports. We know there's a thriving logistics industry here in the Inland Empire that in part depends on that. So what happens in the international trade arena may make a difference for our local economy. So we have to be concerned about the most recent uh, tariffs on steel and aluminum. Uh, we have to be concerned about pulling out of the TPP, be concerned about what's happening with NAFTA I get that we want to have a more level playing field for American producers, uh, and uh, there's always room for improvement on that front. These steel and aluminum tariffs aren't going to make a huge difference to you and me because the amount we import is relatively small. So a lot of the, the hype is posturing more than anything else. But the main message that concerns me is that We've been in an, a, an environment for many decades that has uh, uh, placed an emphasis on more and more open trade. And uh, that more and more open trade posture generally benefits all of us as consumers. And so uh, we're sort of twisting the story right now as we shift to things like uh, tariffs on steel and aluminum we're, we're trying to put emphasis on and, and create some benefits for the producers. I get that. Uh, but it's not going to bring American jobs back. Jobs in manufacturing, for example, were lost not because they moved to China or they moved to Mexico. It's because of technology. Okay? So let's just make sure that we're dealing honestly with these trade issues and uh, not getting caught up in the hype. Infrastructure. Hang on one second. Infrastructure, I want to just m mention, you saw the number, I'm sure if you looked, $4.5 trillion of infrastructure is needed in the U.S. right now. Local, state and local government have committed about $2.5 trillion to that $4.5 trillion. So we have this gap that we need to fill. And the Trump administration is, um, has, has committed to doing something about that. How it's going to accomplish that, I'm not quite sure. But I think the main thing here is to keep in mind that we need, you know, you heard about the infrastructure that's in place here in the Inland Empire that's growing here in Corona. We need more of that everywhere and uh, throughout the United States to make our economy move better and to ensure the economic prosperity of all our residents. So I just don't want us to forget that that's something that has been long overdue and it's something we somehow need to figure out to grapple with. And now let's talk about the next slide, which is healthcare. And it's not that we need health insurance reform, but health spending reform. Our, our total economy, the portion that's committed to health, has been on the rise. And you can see that over on the left-hand side. 
on a per person basis, we spend $9,400, this is from a couple years ago, per person in the United States on healthcare spending. This is not Medicare, uh, it's all types of spending on health services. And you can see how that compares with these other uh, similar uh, developed economies. So we're way ahead in terms of spending. We need to figure out a way to bring that into alignment with what some of these other countries are spending on health care. Because if we don't, what will happen is that upwards of 40% of our economy will go to health care spending. It's probably not the best trajectory for our overall economy. Uh, so there will be needs to a need to do something with Medicare spending, but more generally, I think we need to look at things like preventative health care more seriously. And um, in, indeed, insurance reform of some sort is going to be in the cards for that. Um, but there are so many moving parts. It's such a big part of our economy. We just we we can't, you know, the the, the fight over the Affordable Care Act seems to be over. That's not the right question. That's not the right fight. The fight is over all healthcare spending in this very expensive sector. Next, next slide, please. Monetary policy is something that for the last few years there was really nothing to talk about because interest rates were rock bottom. The financial market, all the money was going into the stock market and a few other alternative investments. But more recently, that has changed. The Fed is raising its Fed funds rate. So that's a policy rate that it controls. Do you care? You should, because if the Fed funds rate goes up, the prime rate goes up. If the prime rate goes up, it affects your home equity line of credit. It affects your rates on credit cards. So the Fed's been nudging this uh, Fed funds rate up over the last couple of years, trying to get it to a sort of neutral position so that in the event we have another recession, it can do something uh, in the way of easing credit. I understand that, but the problem is, um, if we go to the next slide, the lower line is that Fed funds rate. And it's going to, before too long, it's going to push up close to those other two lines. The next one, the red one, is the yield on a 10-year Treasury. So we're talking about a 10-year gap between uh, the Fed funds rate and 10-year Treasuries. And up above is the uh, rate on a 30-year mortgage. As the Fed pushes that rate up, that Fed funds rate, the very short-term rate at which one bank lends to another, um, it creates distortion in the market. Those other two rates that you're looking at are driven by market forces. And the world is a, continues to be awash with liquidity. So market forces are keeping those rates, they're going up, you can see that, but they're not going up very fast. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll see the effect, which is that this thing called a yield curve will flatten. Short-term rates are rising. Long-term rates really haven't moved over the past year on the far right-hand side. And so uh, a flat or actually an inverted yield curve can be a precursor to a recession. So we, we track these short-term and long-term rate movements because we're concerned, not that it's going to cause a recession, but we're just concerned that the, the rate environment has become distorted. So the Fed really has to take it carefully because ultimately it's going to bump into these market-driven rates that are only increasing so fast. And by the way, if we go to the next slide, yeah, remember that market scare at the beginning of the year? Okay, the market correction? Holy cow. Okay, to me, I'm, I'm a Main Street economist, not a Wall Street economist. The way I look at that, they, were ju they just needed to have some more commissions. So. <laughs> You know, there was, a, there was a very strong labor market report in January. And everybody got worried that these wage gains were going to create new, um, uh, they were gonna, that the strong labor market report was going to create new wage gains. The wage gains were going to trigger more inflation. And that's what sent the financial markets into a tizzy. Okay, and then eventually they kind of settled out. Um, the fact is we should expect wage gains with a tight labor market. And uh, Another fact is that we had um, record-setting profits over the last couple of years, and nobody seemed to think twice about that. So why they're worried about returns to labor but not returns to capital, I'm not quite sure about. Uh, the bottom line is that, you know, look at these stock market gyrations and take them with a grain of salt. 
A famous economist said that stock market behavior is driven by animal spirits. Any number of things can move it up or down in any given day, and economic fundamentals are only one of those ingredients that drives it in one direction or, no, or another. You heard from me so far that the, that the, the economy, excuse me, is on solid ground right now and is expected to do well over the next few years. Um, that is reflected in the general upward trend of the stock market despite this most re recent uh, correction. If we go forward, please. All right, so now let's talk about the state. Only have a few minutes left too, so. Um, if we go forward, um, it's a good story to talk about with respect to the state economy. Lowest unemployment rate in over 40 years, okay? Really? Yeah. And very close to the national unemployment rate, which as you can tell here, doesn't happen all that often. Um, as far as job gains are concerned, California added job, jobs at a 2.3% rate, which is among the fastest in the, among the 50 states, okay? And I'm kind of whipping through this, but you already saw the, the national job growth uh, is good and state job growth is good. We've had very strong job gains throughout, uh, throughout the California regions, but if you look at the table on the right-hand side, you'll see that the pace of job gains has slowed. So even um, in the same manner that the U.S. economy has slowed because we're at full employment, uh, we're seeing that that's happened across the regions of the state, including the Inland Empire, which um, it's still very strong, but in 1415, it added jobs at a rate of almost 5%. These last couple of years, it's been just under 4%, okay? Next slide, please. Uh, the Inland Empire continues to be at the top when it comes to percentage job gains around, uh, among the major metropolitan areas of, of California, up 3.5% in February, but really for the last several months, we've been seeing these 3% plus gains in jobs here in the Inland Empire. Uh, I'm sure you, you know that uh, as we came out of the Great Recession, the coastal regions kind of were the first wave of recovery, and these inland regions took off somewhat later, but right now they're going very strong. And in terms of job gains, uh, the Inland Empire is right up there with L.A. County. L.A. County has 4.4 million jobs. Uh, the Inland Empire has about 1.7, 1.8 million jobs, and yet the job gains are nearly, you know, only 10,000 shy. So that speaks to the strength of the local economy and how well it's been doing. Excuse me. Several other indicators tell us that the state of California is doing fine. Uh, gross state product has been increasing. It's uh, been among the fastest growing for the last couple of years. Next slide and taxable sales, which tells us about the spending power of households and businesses in the state of California has been up nicely, uh, just, uh, just under 5%, fairly steadily over the last several quarters. So all of these indicators tell us that the statewide economy has been humming along. Uh, certain parts, certain regions of the state have done better at different times, and right now, uh, the, the, it's the time for the Inland Empire and a couple of the other inland areas to really thrive, even as the, um, uh, some of the coastal parts of California have taken their foot off the gas. So good news at the state level, good news at the national level. These are both a backdrop for what we're going to look at next, looking at the Inland Empire, looking at Riverside County, and at Corona. Next. Uh, the unemployment rate, you heard already, uh, is... Uh, quite low for the city of Corona, under 4%. Uh, the unemployment rate for the Inland Empire, Riverside, and San Bernardino County in the mid 4% range is right on a par with that of, um, excuse me, right on the par with that of LA County, and it's a little bit higher than the state as a whole. Okay, next. And you can see that our, all of our Southern California regional economies have pretty much tracked each other in terms of the unemployment rates, but uh, there was a time when, the very top line there is, is the Inland Empire, there was a time when we had an unemployment rate that pushed up toward 14%. And so for us to say that we've shaved 10 percentage points off of that unemployment rate is just really remarkable. 
Uh, and so um, these are very good times for the local economy. It's on a very solid footing. Uh, not only is the unemployment rate low, but the Inland Empire is among the fastest growing MSAs in the United States at the present time. And I could have said that last month, I could have said that in January, uh, in December, and I could have said that in June of last year. So for several months running, the local economy has been among the fastest growing in terms of job creation across the country. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, we're getting significant contributions from many sectors of the local economy. Construction's at the top of the list in percentage increases. There's a lot of construction happening. We're finally seeing that residential construction is going to be picking up more in 2018. Uh, transportation and warehousing up there at the top of the list, that should be no surprise. It's a key sector of the local economy. Uh, also, we're looking at um, wholesale trade, which ties in with transportation and warehousing to sort of round out the logistics function. Healthcare, uh, really through thick and thin, has added jobs here locally over the last several years. Yes, we're seeing job losses in a couple of places. Nat natural resources and mining uh, has been in a slide for some time uh, because of low commodities prices. But the bottom line is that the sectors of the economy are generally advancing, adding jobs, and growing. Um, when, you know, so much has been discussed about economic development. So let me uh, talk a little bit about that right now. Where, how are we going to grow this economy over the next several years? Uh, to answer that question, I divide our industries into two groups. One is local serving or local population serving, and the other one is external or export oriented, selling to the rest of the world, whether it's to Orange County or to someplace else in the United States or someplace else around the world. And so up at the top, we've got a number of sectors that serve the local population more than anything else. Retail, leisure and hospitality, so eating and drinking places, health care, uh, with the exception of things like uh, academic uh, research institutions that, that bring money in. Um, government is also a local serving sector, okay? On the other hand, you've got all these so external sectors that can grow the economy. Those sectors at the bottom can increase the size of the local economic pie so that there's more to recirculate in the local economy. But not all of these sectors are created alike, okay? This breaks the different sec major sectors of the Riverside economy down. And we've got three pieces of information here. We've got the job count. So construction in September of 17 had 65,000 jobs. It's a pretty good number. Average weekly wage, $1,057. That looks pretty high. And this thing called LQ, location quotient, that's the relative concentration of that industry here compared to the US as a whole. It's 1.9 or about 2. That means that uh, we have about, on percentage basis, the percentage of jobs in construction is about twice as big here compared to the U.S. as a whole. So it's relatively high concentration. If the number is one, we have exactly the same concentration as in the U.S. as a whole. Less than one, uh, a smaller concentration here compared to the U.S. as a whole, okay? So I highlighted in green the sectors that are our external sectors, and so, at the top of the list, we've got transportation and warehousing with a low LQ of 1.7, 40,000 jobs, $741 weekly wage. Then you've got a whole slew of local serving sectors, big job counts, 91,000, 78,000, 94,000. So as I said in the previous slide, there are these local serving sectors have a lot of jobs, okay? but they don't necessarily grow the economic pie, okay? Transportation and warehousing does. We look to the next slide. This is the rest of the industries. So we're looking in descending order by that final column, uh, the location quotient. So you can see in the second slide, all of these are below one. So the concentration here in the inland, in Riverside County is a little bit weaker than the nation as a whole. But here are at the very bottom of the list, a whole slew of sectors that could fill those office buildings that city manager Daryl talked about earlier, okay? Professional and technical services, they have very good paying jobs, uh, averaging well over $1,000 weekly wage. Um, finance and insurance is yet another sector. 
and management of companies and enterprises. When we look at the future of Riverside County, the Inland Empire, West Riverside County, we have to figure out a way to grow some of these other external industries, bring them, make them a part of our own economy, and in turn, that'll enable the other parts, especially the local serving parts of the economy, to grow as well. It's not easily done. We have to think ahead. You know, we've got uh, Rob Fields talking about a strategic plan. We've got um, on the ground, we've got cities that are putting in office space. We've got construction taking place to build new infrastructure. All of these are ingredients in this recipe of economic growth, but let's keep in mind that some of those sectors that were growing, say retail, um, brings money into city coffers, doesn't necessarily expand the size of the economic pie. Okay, all right, let's move on then. So I mentioned that uh, we have these ports not too far away. They're an important part of the infrastructure for the Inland Empire as well as, as, well as all of Southern California, and those ports had a record setting, I mean, blowing all records away kind of performance last year and it's already they're already on track to do even better than that this year so uh, that really speaks to the uh, strength of the domestic economy as well as those of our trading partners can we skip the next couple of slides and then move on because I see that I'm out of time here manufacturing's doing well by the way believe it or not even though we're losing jobs uh, it's back to where it was before the recession in terms of output uh, let's look at real estate then we can go to the next slide. Thanks. So home prices here in Riverside and in San Bernardino are much lower than elsewhere in Southern California, as you can see. Um, price gains are um, in the double digit range, but take a look, sales are off pretty much everywhere with few exceptions like San Bernardino County. What we have is a, is an in a situation where there's just very limited supply, both for existing homes and for new homes. And so we're seeing that show up in the form of higher prices, 11% increase for Riverside County. Um, we need to build more homes. Uh, we need to build more apartments because we have a dire need for rental housing here in the Inland Empire that often goes unnoticed and unheeded. Uh, many people think of the Inland Empire as where people go and buy you know, a home on a significant share of property Maybe they can put a pool in there. Yeah, that's all true. That is a part of the American dream. But until you get to that point, you're probably gonna be renting and you have to be able to afford what you rent. We need to acknowledge that uh, in a better way here in the Inland Empire and also build multifamily even as we're building single family homes. Next slide shows what we have here locally. City of Corona, a median price in the fourth quarter of just over $500,000, somewhat higher than Riverside certainly higher than the city of San Bernardino, and um, there's Anaheim there for comparison. But also notice that sales are down, and it's mainly supply constraint. When the economy is doing well, we should be seeing home prices and sales escalate. So the fact that we're not seeing home sales go up has to do with the fact that we're not, we don't have enough supply of existing homes and we're not building enough new homes. Next slide, please. So our affordability has really fallen. Riverside counties has fallen from 41% to 38. This is the share of households that can't afford to buy the median priced home. Uh, and while affordability here is somewhat better than the coastal counties, uh, the trajectory of course um, is down and that's a troubling notion, troubling feature of what's happening right now. And I already talked about rents being a challenge. Uh, so two things, rents are going up, home ownership's not. Uh, thankfully, incomes are going up, so that's offsetting some of the rent increase. So that's helping. Uh, but if you go to the next slide, you'll see that here in, the, uh, in Riverside County, before the Great Recession, we were building tens of thousands of homes. Now we're ba barely hitting the 10,000 mark. Um, 5,000. Yeah, this is for, the, uh, for, for Riverside only. Um, before the recession, we had significant additions to multifamily stock. We're nowhere near where we were back then. So part of growing the Riverside County economy and the Western Riverside County economy, which is like 60 or 70% of the population, requires that we face up to our housing needs. 
Uh, and it's not just affordable housing for low-income households, it's housing needs for middle-income households because let's face it, even with a median price that's lower uh, here in Riverside County than in LA Orange County, it's still a multiple of, a of the national median price. So we, we have to look at this as a part of the solution for economic growth going forward. Next slide. So, next slide. Wrapping up, I'm sorry I went a little bit over, uh, but all in all, we're seeing that the economy is on a solid footing, expected to grow, actually accelerate in growth at the national level in 2018 and 2019. Not quite 3%, but somewhere between 25 and 3 uh, The state economy is doing well. Uh, but this housing challenge is something that we face both locally and across the state. Um, some of you may know that they're actually passing uh, legislation at the state level that can ha have implications for local jurisdictions about meeting affordable housing needs and things like that. We have to watch that very carefully um, because it, on the one hand it means that uh, it may wrest control from local city councils and local planning agencies. On the other hand, the real the, the the driving force is to face up to our housing needs. And so just any policy that faces up, forces us to face up to our housing needs may be a, sh a warning shot across the bow, but it's not necessarily the best po possible policy. So we just need to be wise about how we go forward in trying to make these improvements as we, as we proceed. You can see that the leading sectors here locally and statewide are some of which we've talked about already. Leisure and hospitality, we expect that to grow. Transportation and warehousing, we expect that to grow. Construction is going to continue to grow. Um, we're seeing more strength in household spending that's showing up in many of those sectors. That's a good thing. But when we look at the long view, we've got to figure out how to grow over the long haul. That's where we go back to our conversation earlier about those industries that are going to grow the, lo the, the local economy so that we have more to share and more to spread around. So on that note, I'm going, to say, I'm going to stop and say thanks and wish you a good day. The preceding presentation was made possible by William Scott Global, a communications firm that creates ongoing corporate video news content for U.S. companies while developing national media distribution strategies that reach targeted niche markets. WilliamScottGlobal.com, news and media distribution experts. And by America's Legacy, helping executives and community leaders share their life stories so future generations can intimately experience their contributions, the moments in their life that defined them, from their greatest achievements to their worst mistakes. AmericasLegacy.us.